just for anyone that was hoping that this might be some about my recent trips to the Antarctic and ice and there's a couple of penguins just to make you feel cheery at the beginning. <laughs> but in actual fact, we are talking about something serious, crystal methamphetamine. And sorry, I couldn't help but put in a bit of an icebreaker. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. But it'd be really good to know what your experiences are to date. What's happening where you are? I work in the drug and alcohol sector. We've been doing this for years. But I need to know what you need to know. I have a presentation, obviously. But I'm happy to mould it in any way that will help your needs. What are you seeing? What are your issues? Yes? I've just come back from a community in the Kimberleys. Mm -hmm. I've been visiting it sort of regularly. And I first started hearing about ice a few years ago. And now I'm seeing families destroyed. Yep. The community is really concerned. Yep. Indigenous and non indigenous. Mm -hmm. So, increase in rate and affecting communities as a whole. Excellent. Yep. Anything else? What yeah. to do? Oh, oh sorry. Yep. You know, when they come in yep. and say, you know, I'm addicted to ice, help me, please. Yep. Very good All point. Too often we yep. hear from young people that say, general practice said, well, there's nothing I can do, you've just got to stop. Okay. Yep. So, what to do in that acute situation <laughs> well, besides so just yeah. stop? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Because that might not be the most effective tool, so we can have a look at that. Yeah. There was just one up the back too. Yeah, we have a lot of um, drug addicts, I suppose, yeah. is a key term for us in our area, and they send all their friends from interstate um, because of the previous situation. It's no longer the case that our doctors will not provide unless they're willing to actually go on a program and get some help. But, um, you know, they come in with shopping lists. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. We're at a loss as to know what to do from not see. Yep, yep, push for time and they're coming in with, with demands of what they want. Yep, and maybe just one last one, or oh, two, maybe quick. Yep. I was just going to say the, um, I'm going to say the acceptance in the younger uh, mm -hmm. teenagers yep. that uh, with experimenting it, uh, using it, it's just accepted. Yes, um, yeah, about that normalisation. Yeah. Yep, that's a big thing. I'll touch on that for you, so that's good. Thank you. And one well, I work with um, homeless and socially isolated people in Brisbane, mm -hmm. so it's certainly becoming more prevalent. And yeah. when you're seeing it filtering in, it used to be much more of an alcohol sort of culture, whereas now these harder drugs, I guess you could say, are starting to come in. Absolutely. So around prevalence and presentations there of, of different drug types. Excellent. So it is a big issue and like it's in the media a lot. So if you were to believe everything in the media, you'd probably think at least half or well, maybe three quarters all of particularly men under 25 are using ice. It's not quite the case. So we'll have a look at the facts as well. The way I thought I'd do that is about setting the scene. What's actually happening? Who's using what where? Also have a look at what we can do about that presentation of that acute presentation which is really hard to manage. What can you do? And particularly there around responding to aggression. And I want to leave you with some key points, hopefully that you can take back with you, about what you can address at your practice to be more effective, or you know, might be effective at the moment, but to address what you're doing at the moment and some <coughs> tips for management here. So methamphetamine, in a nutshell, we know it's a very potent um, central nervous system stimulant, okay? It's usually smoked, that's why it's bolded there, but it can also be injected, swallowed, snorted or shelved. Any idea what shelved is? PR, thank you very much, room full of nurses. Um, if you weren't nurses, up the bum. You know, like, so it's, yes. So people do use it that way as well. Puts a whole new meaning to the word shelving. If you're ever going to Bunnings, be careful about <laughs> asking for the shelving section. Just a little tip there. Um, but like I was saying before, it's very significant there that the most uh, frequent way it's used is smoking and we think about that, it's got, it's got an effect three seconds after it's used. So it's a very instant effect. Of course, it's a conference. I've got to show you a graph of some description, so here it is. So make the most, most of it, all those people. This is from the latest National Drug Strategy Household Survey. So in Australia, once every three years, there's a, a poll, basically, of who's using what. So I've just pulled out the illicit drug use um, slide here. When we look at illicit drugs, you can see here that the most commonly used illicit drug is still cannabis. Okay, so here what it says, over just over 10% of the population are using cannabis. Okay, that's pretty steady. If you look at the dark green, that was the numbers in 2010. Light green, there's been a slight drop, but it wasn't clinically, um, it wasn't significant, so it's just there. 
XTC use has actually dropped. Okay, so that's a bit of an aside. When we look at methamphetamine use, I was really shocked when this came out because I thought we were going to see this, this huge number going up. You know, we've, once again, when you think of the media, and I was like, oh no, what's going on? You know, this is not what we're seeing. But I'll explain why in a minute. Just as an aside to the other illicit drugs, cocaine, much the same, and heroin use is very low, as you can see there. So what's going on with crystal meth? Okay, so this is the significant point. While there was no significant number or increase in the number of people using meth, well, so meth and amphetamine is, is collected into that one term in 2013, there was a change in the main form of the type and the way they were using it. Okay, so you're going, well, God, what's she talking about? But back in 2010, the main um, amphetamine available was speed, okay, the powdered form. Okay, so most people snort, well, if you're going to use amphetamines, you snort speed. Okay, when you start thinking about potency or thinking about bang for your buck, if you like it that way, you're getting about 50 to 60% potency with the powdered form speed. Okay, that's what was available, that's what people were using. We're now in 2013, still same number of people using, however, now they're using crystal methamphetamine, the most potent form of amphetamine, and it is smoked, okay. So now when we start to think about potency or bang, to, bang for your buck, you're looking at 80, sometimes 90% potency, okay. So the number of users haven't changed, but the way they are using it has changed. That's why we are seeing more presentations, okay. When, we'll get to another slide, but it's just coming up in the moment. The thing that sticks with me is that most people say they weren't prepared for that first, or the feeling they got when they first smoked um, crystal meth. Okay, it was so intense. Then, added with the fact that it's got a very long half-life, they're presenting in this, psychotic, in this psychotic way, and there's no quick fix, okay? If you think of heroin for a moment, you know, most people, well not most people, but some people in primary health care setting, particularly ED, their drug and alcohol training up until this point has been if they come in overdosed, it's generally heroin, give them Narcan, they, they wake up, they thank you very much. <laughs> Few people have used Narcan here. And um, they leave, you know. Send you flowers. No. But yeah, you know, I'm taking a bit of a joke. But, but that was the drug and alcohol experience up until this point. It was very quick fix. And it was quite rewarding, you know, like you, you could save this person. We don't have a Narcan equivalent for crystal meth, okay? If they present that way in this psychotic space, state, they're like that and they're probably going to be like it for about six, eight, 12 hours, okay? So that's something to think about. It's about the management. So that's a key point there. Um, what was the next one? Yeah, I've talked about the powder. Oh yes, and also the, the way people are using it as well. So they might have been weekly users, but now we're seeing more daily users. So the more you use, the more chance there is of some sort of psychotic episode, okay? So that's why that's increased. So we're probably seeing increased numbers of presentations to emergency department, primary health care facilities, but the number of users haven't changed. Is everyone happy with that? Whoa, yeah, Jesus. No one was happy with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Depends. Yeah, it's a really good point. Depends on where you live and what your dealer's like, basically. So um, in country areas, or you might just have one dealer and they've got the sort of monopoly on the market, you're looking at about $100 a point, okay? And a point is one-tenth of a gram, so it's a small amount. Um, in city areas where there's a bit more competition, you might be looking at about Oh, I used to say 50, but it's, it's really hard to get to find somewhere. 50 now, not that I'm looking, but I, I do have... <laughs> oh, and it's being recorded, jeepers. Um, um, my sources say, but yeah, around 60 to $70 a point in the city, okay? Oh, absolutely. You're, you're spot on. If, if, if anyone's addicted to anything, um, they're going to find the money for that and not worry about, you know, food, clothes, all that Is sort of stuff. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yep. So they don't have a psychotic... Nope. Nature. There's a lot of people functioning quite well on it. Yeah, not that this is a um, how-to and, you know, good <laughs> idea, but long-haul truck drivers, people that need to keep awake, not all of them, of course, um, but some shift workers. I just had one mention the other day, deep-sea fishermen, for some reason, you know, because they've got to stay awake for, for a certain amount of times. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Um, <laughs> patients who have... Um, do they have further 
um, spontaneous psychotic, psychotic episodes, um, even though they haven't, they've discontinued the use of the drug. Mm -hmm. Are they are they likely to have? It, it depends. The only thing the evidence can tell us is if you've had a psychotic episode in the past, I'll sort of reverse it, yeah, um, that you've got more chances of having one again in the future yeah. when you use, yeah. So, but they might, I mean, if even if you look at the withdrawal and the extinction of the drug from your body or from the person's body, they can sort of have little relapses, but they've just a greater chance in the future, I think I'd say, yeah. yeah. All right. Sorry, Jim, oh, I yes. To ask about the stats. Yeah, sure. Um, and you might have actually said it, and I missed it. Were they self-reported drug use, or yeah. were they people presenting? Yeah. Or? So what that does is capture self-reporters. Okay. <laughs> so what they sometimes do in other studies is triangulate that with um, ambulance figures, uh, ED presentations, and all those kind of things. Oh, and another one that's just come out recently is the number of seizures. Seizures? No, not not. From, from police, yeah, yeah, no, not the, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't coming out right, was it? Yeah, yeah, but they might have a look at those as well. Yeah. Rates. 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 Thank you. Now here, has anyone seen anyone on ice? It's it's much easier to see it on a YouTube than me act it out. So, um, well, no. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. People too, and I see people who look agitated to me. Mm -hmm. They're not drunk. I don't know what they're on. Okay. This Just is have a, a look at this, this and we'll have a chat. Reaction to the guy Matt. He's he's not really following you. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know what you're doing. He's not functioning real well. I'm actually surprised that he's focusing at all. You're not going anywhere. I'm not. You're absolutely right. I got a job to do right here. You're right. Where are you going? Freedom. When? Huh? When? Huh? When are you going there? I've seen you all cleaned up. What are you doing using again? I don't know what to do with that red pink cat. It's for taking bad notes. We're just going to leave you in there for a while until you come down a little bit, okay? He's very, very high on methamphetamines, and uh, it's going to take him quite a while to uh, detox and come down. So he's going to, at some point this evening, crash really hard and sleep for a very long time, and then he'll be a halfway decent human being. So that's a bit of a um, sneak peek. So what did you see there? What was some of the... Going out the, the whole YouTube station. Start back into my... Stop. Um, what did you see there that were some of the symptoms, you'd call it? Classic sores. Yeah, what, what causes the sores? I'm turning this into a, like a... Yep. Why? Yeah, exactly right. So tactile hallucinations. Staying in one spot is really hard. Um, <laughs> tactile hallucinations. So they feel like there's something under the skin. So they kept picking at it and they get quite obsessed with it. So they pick, pick, pick and t that's why you see those sores. What else did you see here with this young man? Very flush. It's a really good point. I think nurses would pick that up. I've shown this to the police and, and they don't get to see that. But that we've got to remember that there's a lot of physical things going on here as well. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So they've got they've got high blood pressure, temperatures probably high. They are at risk of um, stroke, cardiac arrest. You know, from the high and the heart arrhythmias as well. So those physical symptoms. Yep. What about his mental state? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Signs of psychosis. Okay. So we have a, a meth-induced psychosis there, which are hard to manage. Okay. As we can see there, the best option for him at this time was safety for himself and probably maybe for others, he could have got aggressive, um, was to keep him somewhere that he could not harm himself or others. Okay, so a bit of neuroscience, woohoo, on a Sunday afternoon, you were just waiting for this slide too. I think it's really important when we look at, I think his name's Danny, or maybe I've made that up, but when we look at that, the last gentleman, Danny, that's what we see, but I think it's important for us as nurses to understand, well, what's going on underneath? Okay, so here's a quick neuroscience. If we just look at this slide over here for a second, and I'll just 
just ignore the cocaine there for a minute, um, and pretend this is a normal brain. Okay, so you think about it, all your brains here at the moment. You're sitting there quite happily in a relaxed state. You might be a little bit excited because it's such a good presentation. <laughs> so there's some dopamine just being fired out at a fairly relaxed rate, and it's just you know reacting from the presynaptic cleft over to the postsynaptic attaching to the receptor sites there and triggering off that feel-good feeling that, that dopamine does. So that's terrific. As an example, and just a quick, as a comparison, if someone takes cocaine, what it does, it's sort of just got, it's got a one action, okay? It's a very nice drug. It's um, a nice drug. <laughs> that's a, yeah. It's a, it's, a nice, it's a nice drug to manage, okay? It's, um, it's got a short half-life, that's why I say it's a nice drug of only 30 minutes. But what it does, it comes in and it just blocks the reuptake, okay? So, like I said before, when you're all sitting here feeling quite nice, you've got a bit of dopamine, anything that doesn't get used gets um, taken back through the, the, transmitter, uh, the um, transporter reuptake there and it's ready for use when you need it again. What cocaine does is block that, okay? So the dopamine's released from the presynaptic cleft. There's more available then, so the minute, or the second I should say, that a receptor site becomes available, it attaches and then that person start, keeps feeling the, the euphoria attached with dopamine. So that's just, like I said, one, one way, that do, the only way cocaine works. When we look at crystal methamphetamine or methamphetamine we'll here, it works very differently. Okay, it has, oh damn it, it has a penguin. <laughs> um, it has a threefold action. So first of all, it actually enters into the presynaptic neuron. Okay, so it enters in. Once in there, it goes into the cell and forces out the dopamine. Okay, so it's forced out. <laughs> There's an absolute flooding of dopamine in the um, in the synaptic cleft there. So once again, the second that any is available, it's attaching and keeps, oh God, it keeps stimulating the, um, the effect. It also works, it also works by not only just blocking the reuptake, but reversing the transporter. Okay, so it reverses this action here. So it's not just blocking, it's reversing it. So any when the dopamine's being forced out of these cells, it's just flooding it back in, okay? So there's just this massive flood all the time of dopamine, okay? So it's just being um, flooded and it's exciting the postsynaptic neuron all the time, okay? And that's happening right throughout the brain. So when you get that sort of feeling, do you understand why Danny might present the way he does? Okay, there's just chaos going, it's just firing, firing, firing. The other thing to mention as well, like what I mentioned with cocaine being the nice drug because it's only got a half-life of 30 minutes, methamphetamine can have a half-life of four, six, eight hours, the half-life, okay? So when someone's affected by it, they could stay this way with this massive firing of neurons for hours, okay? So, um, you know, 10, 12, 14, 16 hours on one point, you know, like so, yeah. So, so bang for your buck. It's, um, what a big bang. Okay, now I can talk about the penguin. For anyone that was starting to get a bit overwhelmed with neuroscience on a Saturday afternoon, I'll take you back to that, that the calm of the penguin. Are there any questions on that, though, before we go on to this? That just sounds like yeah. people on ice uh, tend to, but they probably don't need to, probably use you that because they're yep. getting such a hit from the No, <laughs> exactly. No, you, you are spot on. Yep. So we know that with, with meth, with crystal meth, a lot, it, it sits within the context of polydrug use for a number of reasons. Well, the main one is the come down. Okay, the come down is so bad, that's why people keep using. You know, that you might hear, oh, it's more addictive than other drugs. Yeah, it's a bit of a hard thing to measure. But what we know is that the come down's so bad that people keep using to avoid the come down. So that sort of goes into dependence that way. But when they start coming down, they'll start to use drugs like benzos, alcohol depressant drugs. Um, heroin if it's available, cannabis a lot. And I've heard, because I, I do these presentations with um, the AFP in, in Canberra, and they're talking about dealers that they've come across who are sort of multi, I don't think it's multitasking. What do you call it when you yeah. buy chips with your fries? You know, that's... Upselling. Yeah. Upselling, up 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 yeah. So someone goes to buy their crystal meth, oh, maybe you'd like some heroin to help with your come down. You know, like, so that's, that's nice. <laughs> you know, like, so... But see, that's, that's why we've got the poly drug use. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Four Boom. hours in, you yep. just keep Absolutely. Can I ask another question just about the actual smoking? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what sort of pipe. If it's oh, like have I got a picture of it? Or if it's just a dry pipe. But what happens with the passive smoke? Is there, uh, do we know much about the effects of people in the room? It's not quite like cannabis. Yeah, that's yeah. What I'm because it, there's a picture of the pipe there. Yeah, um, so you put the small amount. Mm, I won't even try that. Um, but the small amount of the, that's probably the best example there of the real crystal meth, the ice. Small amount in the pipe, heat it, it melts, vaporises, and the person inhales that smoke. So there's not that sort of big smoke bomb right. that you it's might see in, in, yeah, in the Cheech and Chong movies, you know, yeah. like that, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, so it's a little bit different that way. And that doesn't have the same kind of smell either. It's a bit sort of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because mm. I thought it would be the other way. I thought that if they had that amazing half life, they would be less inclined to use other drugs. But that's nah. really scary that they suddenly become yeah. this little Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if people want to keep partying as well, you know, like, because there's a reason people take this is to stay awake and, mm. and feel like that in a controlled state. Um, they might put other things on board too to think it's going to help with the high. Oh, over this side. Yes. And my understanding is that one, one pipe will displace the available dopamine for two weeks. Wow, oh. yeah. So that, that's why that crash is so mm. bad. Mm. And that <coughs> in working with these recovering folks, if you can get them to not use yeah. for three weeks, their brain will start to regenerate. Yep. But if they keep using, mm. then they, they, they'll literally just fly with their dopamine machinery. Yeah, absolutely. Out. And that's what we're seeing because at the moment now, um, the research is saying people don't normally come into treatment until about five years into use. So you can imagine what's happening to the dopamine receptors. And so what we're seeing is a presentation of really clinical depression because they don't have the dopamine to, to fire off. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yes? Oh, I wish it, it's, it's a really hard one. That Some people can have psychotic episodes the first time they use, some people can be using for years and then something happens. It's, it's really unpredictable. That's the nastiness about this drug. You know, a few times, like particularly with the police, they say, you know, what can you tell us about crystal meth? And I'm going, it's a really nasty drug and hard to manage. You know, like, and that's not quite the answer they want. Um, but it is because of that unpredictability. Yeah. There's an, Oh. Mm. Mm. No, nah. nah. no. But like I said before, there's people that are using it quite effectively, yeah. you know, because the whole reason, actually, we might get to that slide, sorry for a sec, um, <coughs> is why people use, you know, that increased energy and endurance, motivation, euphoria, confidence, alert, alertness. People are using it for a reason, mm -hmm. you know, like it's quite good. There's someone that's very committed up the back there with a the commitment. Oh, yeah. And I said, you did what? Yeah. I've never heard it before. She said, yeah. I injected it. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. She had a psychotic yep. episode, went tacky party, mm. and shaking, and ended up in our Spencer mental health ward. Wow, yeah, night. yeah. It's very frightening, yeah. So there, there's the same sort of thing, even though some might, she might have smoked it for many years, even, I'm just, you know, as a guess. Then she injected it. Oh, she was swallowing it, yep. Even the change of method can, you know, can bring something on unexpectedly. Yes. Random question. Yeah. Breaking Bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so close to home. I can hardly watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you think that's affected the culture? It might have. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know for sure. So it's, a, it's an off-the-cuff comment, but it could be because it sort of made it a bit cool. Mm. Yeah. And sorry, you've had your hand up there for a while. Yeah. 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 Dopamine mediated is the impact on noradrenaline. Yep. Yep. Good point. There's, when it's first, well, I'll go with just smoked. Well, it's probably the same when it's whacked or injected. Oh, I'll go with the injected. Um, it has an immediate effect on the adrenal glands as well for a, a huge burst of adrenaline. Okay, so that's why some of these, you know, even small people here, they've got yeah. huge amounts of energy, yeah. massive amounts of adrenaline, and also on serotonin. So the serotonin part of it is, is in, increases their sex drive, sex desires, and all that 
that kind of thing. I had a funny anecdote, but because I'm being filmed, I might wait till that's now. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone at home will be going, oh, I wonder what she said. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh. One question and then I'll tell you. Is there any sort of trajectory where, mm -hmm. like, I, I experienced my first experience three weeks ago, like at a wedding or a post wedding? I was at wow. the and a girl was out the front at the barbecue the next day, and she was. I've never experienced anything like it, and I've worked in lots of different mm. environments, and she was picking furiously at her skin and just absolutely off her trolley. Mm. And I just wondered if there's some sort of. You go through the picking stage, then you get the high, and then you come to, oh, oh, look, it's, it's, yeah. Do? Like, do you know where they are in their high, according to their... Uh, no. It's a hard one, only because it, it is different for every person. At some stage, they will crash, but when they will, that's, that's, that's hard to know. the most distressing thing yeah. I've experienced. Yeah, yeah. it can be hard. I being a nurse, I was just... Being a guest, person. yeah. <laughs> So everyone's forgot about my serotonin story. Oh, okay, okay. So I give some group, you know, education sessions at various places. And one was at a homeless um, shelter, a homeless men's home. And I was telling him about crystal meth and all this sort of stuff. And everyone's going, oh, yeah, well, I've used it. And then one guy said, he goes, I don't get crystal meth or ice. He said, I used it. I just cleaned the house for solidly for two days and got really horny. What's the point? <laughs> and I'm like... And I'm like, yes. But luckily the nurse kicked in and I just went, oh, that's the serotonin. Any other questions? You know, like it was just, God, saved. Yeah, yeah, what was the problem? Yeah, so it, but anyway, yes, so it does affect serotonin as well. Thank you for that question. <laughs> so like we've mentioned before too, there's, these are the ways, of, well, say, let's say types of use. So experimental use is very big. So like you're saying, things like Breaking Bad, they might think, oh, yeah, we might give that a try. One of the biggest indicators or impacts on experimental use with young people is what their friends are doing, okay? That's with, that goes with all drugs, okay? So if you want to know what someone's doing or using, ask just casually what their friends are using. That's probably a good sign. It's beyond, or it's, it's kind of different to peer pressure. We all go, oh, it's all peer pressure. It's different. It's about a sense of belonging, okay? So if that's their group and that's what they're doing, I'll do that because I want to belong to this group. So it's, it's very, that has the most impact as a risk factor. Recreational use, so people will start saying, well, I'll just use it once a, a month or might go down to once a week or whenever I've got money or whenever someone's in town or something like that. Circumstantial use too, we've mentioned about, you know, long haul truck drivers or people that need to stay awake for whatever reason. Can go on to regular use, which we've mentioned, and I've also <laughs> mentioned polydrug use. So this is what the sort of types that we're seeing. The effects, so like I've mentioned before, four to six hours, but I've mainly seen out to 12 hours mainly with single doses and much longer with repeated use, as we've mentioned. I just want to stress this bottom point yet again because I think it, it's so important when we're, we're thinking about the management of people who might present um, intoxicated, is that I feel, I believe that people, they don't go out with that intent of I'm going to use this drug. I'm going to end up in the emergency department and punch someone. I mean, it's just not it. And this is what reinforces it, that they're just not ready or they're not prepared for the strength of the experience, okay? So when you are managing someone that's using, you know, that, try not to, you know, advise not to question the intent. And it sort of comes back, back to being non-judgmental as well. Just put it into context a bit. As I mentioned before, and we've seen some of this with Danny um, about some of the, the psychological effects on one side, but I just really want to stress again around these um, physical effects, okay, the hypothermia, the malnutrition. Okay, once again, this is a, a stimulant drug. It also depresses the appetite. So the person does not eat. Now everyone's going, oh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Good exercise. <laughs> no. Um, depresses the um the appetite, so they become quite malnutritious, uh, malnutritioned, I should say. And it, it's not just a little bit of weight loss. If you see some of those pictures that are around, it, they're very gaunt. There's muscle wasting as well, okay, um, with regular use. The high blood pressure that I've mentioned before. Oh, also on this side too is, um, it's, it talks about jerky movements that you might see in some either clients or on depicted on television. Once again, that's related to the dopamine, the, the um, 
depletion of dopamine. We need dopamine for those smooth muscle movements and, and movements. And when that's interrupted, they'll start having these jerky movements as well. Like a yeah, it presents like a Parkinson's. Yeah, very much so. I haven't got a video of that. I should have. <laughs> Okay, once again, so we start looking at methamphetamine toxicity. So if you think for a moment there, there's desired use and, you know, people use this for a reason, the euphoria to stay awake, whatever. If they use more than their body can handle. This is what we start seeing, the psychosis, paranoia. People are easily startled. When you're thinking about your own practice, try and think about, you know, if you have someone that's um, affected by ice, about try to keep other noises to a minimum, okay? Any noise can be, can startle someone very, quite badly. It's really interesting even if you're talking to someone or, you know, doing an interview and assessment, they might not have used for a while, but there still is a bit of edginess about the person. It can make you feel a little uncomfortable. So just, you know, just think about that yourself, how you feel. Um, the acute paranoia is, oh, as I've said that, hallucinations, agitation, and may become aggressive or violent. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I think I might have covered most of this in our, in our questions, so I'll just make sure I haven't missed anything. Oh yeah, with the psychosis, like we were reading there, it often clears within about a week of stopping use. Okay, that's, you know, if you think of a bell curve, um, it's usually about a week. But I have worked with people who are about three to six months in to their psychosis, that they're just not reversing. Okay, so it's really sad to see, you know, young, professional people and, hmm, you know, just a, a Bad choice, and that this is what's happening. Really hard on them and their family. Oh, was that a photo of me? No, 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 no sorry. No, no. I wasn't was looking. Yes, sorry. I was going to tell you from the psychiatric perspective yeah. that um, meth addicts try to um, get people Seroquel. So if mm. somebody is on Seroquel for schizophrenia or bipolar or something, um, they can be targeted by meth addicts because Seroquel really helps the come lessen down. the come down. Yeah. Mm. So we've had cases in our clinic where patients would get mugged for their surgery. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And they'd hang out yeah. and watch them leave the pharmacy. Oh, that's sad. all people, like folks with schizophrenia. So. Yeah. It's yeah, it's, it's a good point. Well. Oh, they do. Yeah. yeah, they know they're drugs. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's it. And that's going back to your point about the person who said, you know, they, they whacked it instead. If you're not sure of a term, just ask the person. They'll, they'll soon tell you. Yeah. So, um, and don't feel any shame in that. I still ask if I don't know. Once again, I've just uh, all the time, absolutely new names. So once I've just put this slide in there to remind us that when you are dealing with someone affected, that you are it is a presentation of psychosis. Okay, so if you have guidelines and you're going, oh, I haven't got any guidelines around how to manage someone that's you know. Yeah, I'm intoxicated with crystal methamphetamine, go with your mental health guidelines around your psychosis. What would you do in it with anyone else who is in a psychotic state? The only difference is here that we know what's caused it, okay, generally, because you'll probably find out from someone that they've used. But it's, a, it's the same as any other presentation there, you know, around that the person will be experienced, probably um, be ex um, experienced some sort of hallucinations, <coughs> delusions. So they're, they're in a, something that's, you know, they're not seeing the world as you are. We've got time for another YouTube, oh, maybe. Yeah, of course we have. Ooh. Okay, cool. So this one here, I couldn't actually find, um, I, I do look at YouTube a lot, um, that was someone affected by ice who became psychotic. But this one's from America, but they, they, the signs of psychosis are there, and this person has used crack, which is different, I do know, but the, the same symptoms are coming through. So just have a quick look at this. Yeah, it's it. Hey, what's up? Ketchup, mushroom. Yeah, it's yeah, on what's the crack up? Pipe, yep. <laughs> Tony Wood, Boss Man. I own the satellites. I own Facebook. I put a million dollars on Italian mafia. That's my island, Russia. I'm not joking. Why are you recording me on my own phone? Crack kills. This is a lawsuit. Say, get out of right here. here, a bloody score. Yes, 
or what is for missiles and national security of the United States and blowing the cover of ketchup, mustard, and yes, of an architect company that is for international. You can face the federal pension. Now, U.S. Marshal, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do would be easy to get to court law. Now, you just fucked up. Now, right here, my name get is back. King. It's your fucking crazy ass back. Wait, Look, don't record check me. this out. Go get some, hey, go get some mayonnaise, nigga. Bitch, you fucked up. I don't give a fuck. Go tell the army. That's my shit you're on. U.S. Marshal. Hey. You better Chris get back? You better get this shit on here. Huh? I don't give a fuck. What's up, Kelly? What's up, everybody on the internet? I run this shit. I run this shit. I got those pipes protected. And yeah, those are my satellites. What's up? Who? Who's Tim? I own that shit. Now, Michelle, what's so funny? I have the satellites, so why the fuck do we need a building for a people <laughs> working when we can just do it on chips on salad? That's my favorite sign. Ketchup, the must. We were trying to save people for tax money. <laughs> U.S. Marshal, Randy mm. Dunn, you're blowing my cover. Now, don't get a damn drug law. Now, right there, you just keep this for your pulse and your use. Now, what's up? My rocks. Bitch, you shut the fuck up. Yeah, you better, you better come through to me. You better be here. Absolutely. You got set up, you still got a chip. I'm going to make some money. You're now, I'm going to out my bitch. Yeah. So you can see that it's lost touch with reality. Obviously, there. Who are you talking to? Yeah. So there's that loss of reality, like someone mentioned too, very vulnerable to attacks or anything like that. And like, um, what was your point? It was really. Why would you do that? Or, uh, yeah, how yeah. could you see that as enjoyable? Yeah, and one of the things is, going back to the point too, because someone says, oh, do, do people remember this? Yeah, right. And that they might remember bits, and I'll go, oh, yeah, I spent, you know, 10 minutes over at Toddy's, I don't making up all these names. Um, but she might have been there for three hours. Like, there's just no sense of time, you know, and then the way that they well, ask her to leave is say, I think there's someone, you know, breaking into your house. Um, so they've bought into a delusion, which you should never do, you know, but, um, yeah, so the, the whole aspect of time just, just goes, so it's quite distressing. You know, and, and kind of speaking to your point, in the patients that I work with in the psychiatric clinic, um, they, they hate being on the drug, but they use it because they can't stand the pain, the emptiness mm. in their brain mm. when the when they have So when they don't have, and they don't have, they have the, it's just a dopamine vacuum. Mm. And mm. they can't stand it. Yep, to get that and rush the again. the problem is, over time, if they really overuse it, they can't get any more dopamine produced because the brain can only make so much, mm -hmm. and then they get very suicidal. And then what after that? It and just takes a long time. They, they, you know, the brain will kick itself back in, but you have to be abstinent for a long time. Mm, let's give it and time. then they're just they're so depressed, and so it just, it's a mental void. Yep. This doesn't last forever, okay, I've said it goes on for 18 or 12 hours, but be mindful that there is a crash, okay, and they call it crash for a reason because the person does crash, okay. They fall asleep and it can be anywhere from like 12, 18, maybe 24 hours and you think, oh, well, that's good news. Yes and no. As nurses, we should be thinking about some, you know, things like rhabdomyolysis, people lying, we've had ex um, episodes of that, people might be lying in a strange position leg, arm or whatever, um, so we have to think about that. I've mentioned the come down, so I've got, I've just a bit stretched for time, so I'll just go to this. This is not an eye test, okay, but it just tells you um, that there's three distinct phases to methamphetamine withdrawal, the crash, so they sleep for 12, 24 hours. Instead of reading that, the thing that always sticks with me, and it's better than any textbook, is when I was working in detox, the clients, what, it's sort of, it was nearly textbook what they were doing. They'd sort of, um, they'd sleep for a long time. They usually use in the car park before they come up, you know, as their final hurrah. Um, then that's finished. They, they crash and they crash for like the 12, 24 hours. They wake up, okay. Um, you might think, oh, after a great sleep, 
you know, that, that's good, no. They're usually angry and really hungry, okay? Because think to an appetite suppressant, they don't. They usually come out, you know, mumble something at you, go off to the kitchen, eat a whole loaf of bread, a chicken, and well, not, not the live one, like a <laughs> baked one, um, um, and then go back to bed. You know, like, so it's just that, that sort of um, process of waking up very sort of agitated from the, you know, the receptors trying to, you know, find what they're supposed to be doing, and also that, that hunger. And they can be quite dehydrated as well, okay? So we have to think about fluid replacement as well. I'll just skip over this. I really want to get to, to this point about what can be some of your take-home messages. We've seen there that, like I've said before, you know, my whole sell on this is it's a, a nasty drug and hard to manage, but there are some things you can do. Turning Point, which is an organisation in Victoria, put out a document. It was in 2008, um, and it's about uh, managing challenging behaviour with people who have used um, methamphetamine. So it's a fantastic one if you can get a copy of it. I'll, put, I'll get a link to it in a moment. And what they talk about is the before, during and after. Okay, and I think it's really appropriate for your settings. Before we're talking about are you ready for someone to walk into your practice who's affected by crystal methamphetamine? Or any drug for that matter, but we're just focusing on crystal meth at the moment. Are you ready? Are your staff aware of what it is, what they should do when presented like that? Have you got duress alarms? Is there anything about the environment that you could do to help that, that situation? You know, things like opening hours, are there security around? You know, what, what emergency um, backup do you have? Staff education and training as well around things like um, asking the questions about, you know, has someone used that drug? It might be that you do brief intervention in your practice. Are you doing that? Are your staff trained? And do you have a process for regular monitoring and reviewing what's going on with these presentations? Okay, so that's the before, so you're, you're ready in case anything happens. The during once again around staff training and education about identifying those early signs of aggression. If someone's starting to escalate, you know, what do you do? Obviously we, we want to try and de-escalate in our response. But here I'm talking to you not just about the, the practice clinical staff, but what about your admin staff and, and the front desk staff? What, what can they do to help the situation as well as identifying that risk? So around the de-escalation skills, you know, how, how, how do you feel about what are your de-escalation skills like and your communication strategy? You know, what would you do in this situation? And that's really difficult when you've got a waiver in front of people too. Yes. Very good point. Very good point. And we once you go back, go back to Danny, how would he be in your waiting room? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. There's plenty of chairs to pick up and throw. Yeah, absolutely. So the tip there is, you know, like, be honest. You know, like, lines like, doctor won't be long, is not going to be good because even though they, have, they haven't got that concept of time, they're not going to be able to sit in a chair politely um, with all this going on. So if it's going to be, the doctor can see you in half an hour, do you want to go and come back? You know, like, you know, the, the confined space is not going to work. The waiting is not going to is not going to work. So can you, you know, go, do you want me to text you when it's time? You know, like, do you want to go for a walk? Something, you know, like that, that kind of stuff. We've actually had to call the police. Yeah, and that's it. And that, that could be part, when you go back to your before, mm. what, is, what is your plan? Who do you ring? Where are those numbers? Are they near the phone? Is there a direct, you know, there's got to be something, something there as well. Um, and after, oh, sorry, back to the before as well. Who, you know, and you might be working with someone like this, who are you referring this person to as well? Have those numbers, you know, you know down the track as well. After, if there's been some sort of challenging situation, there will be a sort of um, a recovery time that you'll need for your staff and your practice, so that might include some debriefing. And review the situation. What can you learn from the situation that happened? What, some things might have worked really well and what didn't go so well and um, preparing the service for the user's return. So they might have just been a one-off, they might have been known to your service before, or this might be an ongoing thing and they might have to, to look at other options as well. So summary, with my 30 <coughs> seconds on the clock, it's, it feels like my kitchen rules, I've been watching that. Oh, phew, quick plate up. Um, each individual is different and requires a tailored response. Methamphetamine use should be addressed in the context of other drug use, okay, mental health and other psychosocial problems or factors, 
And drug use is a cyclical and relapsing condition. Intervention may need to be applied repeatedly before significant change is achieved. My leaving message is don't give up. There is hope. We do have a lot of good news stories. People can get off crystal meth. So keep up the good work. <coughs> a penguin.